Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. God bless you this morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Set free. Yes, free. I'm a child of God. Yes, I Hallelujah, Jesus. I bless you this morning. There's, house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah to your name, O oh God. Hallelujah, Father. We just thank you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to the name of God. Hallelujah, God. We thank you this morning. We thank you this morning. We thank you this morning, Jesus. We thank you this morning. We bless you this morning. Hallelujah to you, Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, I give you glory this morning. I give you glory this morning. I give you glory this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I give you glory this morning, God. Let somebody's life be changed this morning. Let somebody receive their miracle this morning. Hallelujah. Let somebody hunger for you this morning, even the more, oh God. In the name of Jesus. Let them seek you, Father. Let them seek you like never before, Father God. Those that are don't want to make a decision or they're, 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 they're undecisive, Father, I pray that you will begin to touch the hearts of men to come to you, Father God. Let them know that you love them and that you're waiting for them to come. Touch them this morning, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for this month of February. We thank you for this blessed month. Father, we decree and declare this month is going to be blessed in Jesus' name. We decree that no weapon for and against us this month is going to prosper. We decree, Father God, that unmerited, your unmerited favor be upon us this month. Father God, that the impossible will happen. Supernaturally, things are going to begin to happen. Supernaturally, income in our finances. Supernatural, Father God. You've done it before. Father, supernaturally, supernaturally things are going to change. Hallelujah, this month, Father God. Those that are sick will be healed, God. Those that have been waiting for answers will be uh, receive the answers that they've been waiting for. Father, there will be marriages, there will be relationships, restoration this month, oh God. In the name of Jesus, oh God. Father God, we ask you to remove every cane, every aching out of our lives in the name of Jesus. Every aching. Father, that's that comes to destroy. We remove it now in the name of Jesus. We cancel every assignment of every aching in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God. Even now, Lord God. Even now, Lord God, as we speak and as I speak, Father God, I decree and declare that, Father God, that no, no one, no one, Father, can stand against you, stand against your power, stand against your word, stand against what you can do, Father God. We fear nothing. Father, you said for us not to fear anything. Hallelujah. According to Timothy, Father God, in the name of fear, love, power, and the sound mind. Father, help us to stand up. Father God, as strong soldiers. Father God, in the army of the Lord. And fight, Father God, this, this battle. This faith battle, Father. Hallelujah. 
God bless you, everybody. God bless you. God bless you, everyone. God bless you. I was sharing the broadcast with a few people. God bless you this morning. God bless you this morning. I'm going to be praying for our February. We're going to be praying for February this morning. That God will move for this month for us. Amen. That God will move for February for us. That he will bless us like never before in this month. Hallelujah, Jesus. Because life and death is in the power of our tongue. We can actually confess things and it can happen. You just got to believe God. You just got to believe him. Hallelujah. We just got to believe. If you believe him, then he can do it. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. If you guys can kindly share this broadcast with Pastor Carmen, because for some reason she is not on my thing. I can't get her on here. So um, I don't know if you guys are able to share with her, because if I do, I have to come out of this. So if, if someone can share the broadcast with her. Hallelujah. God bless you, Pastor Julia. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank God for his mercy. We thank God for his mercy. We thank God for what he's doing. We thank God for what he's going to do. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, yesterday we talked about victory. The victory of the Lord. We talked about victory yesterday. Hallelujah. We talked about victory yesterday. How God is going to move by his spirit. Amen. How he's going to move by his spirit. Because he's a good God. He is a good God. Hallelujah, Jesus. So we're going to talk about commitment today. Commitment. How are you, how, how much are you committed to him? Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, we just thank you this morning for those that are on here. We thank you for those that are coming. Father, we thank you, Father, for your mercy, your grace. That, Father God, we thank you for waking us up this morning in our right mind, Father. We didn't have to wake up this morning, God. Many did not wake up. But, Father, I thank you that you found it us faithful and found it mercy on us to wake us up this morning in our right mind to wake us up father god in the name of jesus and we thank you we don't take it lightly father many did not wake up this morning father god we don't take it lightly that you gave us another chance just to be here today to to see another day to accomplish the work that you have for us god we don't take that lightly we don't take it lightly we do not take that lightly and we thank you we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your mercy, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we give you glory. We give you honor this morning. Father God, I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. There's not enough thank yous for the little things that you do. It don't have to be big things, but just the little things that you do for us, God. Just the small things that you do for us. The little things. The little things that you do for us. Excuse me. The things that you do for us, oh God. Just the little small things that you do for us, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We're going to confess for February. Psalms 91, 7 through 10. Hallelujah. Thank you for the new month of February. We thank you, God, for the new month of February. We thank you for the month of February today. We take authority over this month of February. It shall be my month and your month. Of double honor in the name of Jesus. Element forces hear the word of the Lord. Corporate with our destiny this month in Jesus name. Cooperate. Cooperate with our destiny this month. Hallelujah. We cover every day of this month with your blood. The blood of Jesus. We cover it with the blood of Jesus. We cover it with the blood of Jesus. We cover our finances. We cover our children. We cover everything, Father God, with the blood of Jesus this morning. We cover it with the blood of Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Father God, any sickness, we cover it with the blood of Jesus. We're not sick. We're not sick. And we will not decree that we're sick. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, we cover every journey. Every journey that we shall embark upon this month. Every journey that we shall embark upon this month. Hallelujah, Jesus. That we will be successful in anything. Hallelujah. And we will embark on it with the blood of Jesus. We embark on it with Jesus. Our Father, let your presence, your presence guide us throughout this year. In the mighty name of Jesus. Guide us. Guide us through this month of February. There will be no, no failure this month. In the mighty name of Jesus. God of mercy, connect us to our divine helpers this month. Our divine helpers. Those that are supposed to take us to the next level. Those that are supposed to catapult us to where we need to go. This month, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Father God. Timely helpers, locate us. 
this very month by fire in the name of Jesus. Do you know that when God sends the helpers, there are people that are assigned to help you get to where you're going. There are people that are assigned to help you make it to certain levels. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Timely helpers, locate us in this very month by fire. Have an uncommon help open unto us by fire this month in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, our Father, make us wiser than our enemies in this month in the name of Jesus. God, we decree and declare this month that we will receive the wisdom and the wise wisdom, Father, to deal with every situation in this month. In this month, in the name of Jesus. In this month, oh, Lord, our Father, make us wiser. Make us wiser than our enemies. We receive the month of wisdom. We receive the mouth of wisdom, the mouth. That we speak wisdom, that we speak life, that we speak life in the name of Jesus this month. That we speak life and no speak anything else but the word of God. Because the word of God is life. Hallelujah, Jesus. With our adversaries cannot overcome in the name of Jesus. They cannot overcome you if you speak the word. When the wicked, even our enemies and our foes came upon us to eat our flesh in the month of February. They shall stumble, fall, and die in the name of Jesus. We're talking about a spirit. We're not talking about a person. Our haters shall go down and shall arise in this month. It shall not arise in this month in the name of Jesus. They shall go down. And you shall arise. You shall arise in this month. Oh God, our father, break the teeth of the ungodly assigned against us in this month in the name of Jesus. Bewitchment target against our family in this month. Backfire in the mighty name of Jesus. Our blood and that of our family members shall not be shed by violent men in this month in the name of Jesus. We shall not be used for sacrifices by the power, hallelujah, in the blood of Jesus. We shall not be used for sacrifices this month. We shall not, not us, not our family members, not our grandchildren, not our children, not our lineage, will not be used this month for sacrifices. If you didn't know, that stuff goes on. Hallelujah, Jesus. We will not be used this month for sacrifices. Disaster, tragedy, sorrow target against us and our family for this month. Backfire in Jesus' name. In the month of February, we decree that we shall not eat the bread of sorrow nor drink the water of afflictions in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. For your for our missionaries, our evangelists this month, Father, we ask that you will cover them, protect them this month. Father God, those that are coming as well, Father, in the name of Jesus, protect them this month. Protect each and every one of them this month, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that this month is going to be blessed. We thank you that this month, Father God, we will do those things that you asked us to do. We will do those things, Father God. We will be more committed this month than we ever been before, Father God. Help us to be committed unto you, O God. Father, help us to be committed unto you, O God. Help us to be committed to you. Oh, God, help us to be committed to you. God, you're calling us to be committed. Committed unto you. Committed unto you, Father. Not to men, but to you. Hallelujah. But to you, oh God, Father, help us to be obedient to you this month. Help us to be obedient to you this month. Hallelujah, Jesus. Help us to be obedient to you this month in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Help us to be obedient like never before, Father. Help us to call upon you in the day of trouble and you shall answer, Father, in the name of Jesus. Help us, oh God. Help us not to look into our own our own situation to help us not to look into how we can fix it, but to look into you for the answers. The answer come from you, not from man. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let this month be a month of blessings, a month of commitment, commitment unto you, O oh God. What does it mean to be committed to God? It says that certain decisions that are made in advance, irrespective of the circumstances. In other words, it doesn't matter what the circumstances look like or what the circumstances may be or what's happening or what's coming, but for you to be committed to the word of God. And I will honor Christ wherever the pain and whatever the cost. That means it doesn't matter. God bless you, everyone. God bless you, Elizabeth. God bless you, Pastor Carmen. 
that we are committed no matter what the cost is. We will obey God's word, even when that is the hardest thing to do. Because there's circumstances that comes in their life that it gets very, very difficult. And you got to make a decision. Are you going to obey God? Are you going to... Are you going to just not fall off? Are you not going to, you're not going to do what God called you to do? Are you going to continue to move forward in God? Every commitment is a choice. Amen. Every commitment is a choice. No real commitment was ever made without someone first choosing to make it. If you commit to going out and having sex, you already made up in your mind that that's what you were going to do. You were going to go fornicate. That was already in your mind. You already committed to doing that. If you're committed that you're going to steal, that's already, you You made that commitment. Every commitment requires special, uh, I'm sorry, every commitment requires personal responsibility. We have to have a responsibility for the things that we do. God bless you. God bless you, Ruth. Every commitment requires personal responsibility. You know, we want to blame people for things that are happening in our lives. Some of it is spiritual. Some of it is just the decisions that we make. Some of it is spiritual. Like on last week when I came on here and uh, uh, God told me to pray against witches, that was a spiritual war going on in the spirit. Because I slept like a baby the day after that. So I know that there was something going on in the spirit. Every commitment requires honesty and integrity. You got to be honest with yourself. You got to be honest with yourself where you are and, 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 and where you want to go. Every commitment is a promise. And every commitment requires a choice. So what choice are we making? What choice are we making? Are we making the, the choices to, to be committed to God or to be committed to whatever we're trying to do? Because if you're committed to God, God, God says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. So if you seek him, yeah, that honesty and integrity, because a lot of people are not honest. Yes, we got to be, we got to have that integrity and honesty. We really do because that's, a, that's very important to, to have that. How important it is to commit to God. How is it, how important God wants you to be committed to him so that the word, the world may know him, that the world may know he is important to you. So if you, if you can be committed to God, how are you going to com be committed to a marriage? If you can be committed to God, how are you going to be committed to his, his, his work? You first got to be committed to him. Some of us want, want, want this and want that. One of us, some of us want to be, you know, want to be in ministry because a lot, a lot of people want to be seen, but you have no idea what you're going to get yourself into. This is not a walk in the park. <laughs> God's got to make you re be ready for this. What does the Bible say about commitment? What does the word of God says about commitment? There are numerous references in the Bible addressing the Christian's commitment and various aspects of life to our families, neighbors, employers, the church, our health. And in all things we do and say. Ephesians. Let's go to the scriptures because I, I love reading the word of God. Let's go to the scriptures because God wants us to be committed. Some of us are not where we need to be because we're not committed. We're really not. We're not committed. We say we are, but we're not. And I say, I even say myself, because I, I believe I could pray more. Honestly, if you want to be honest about it, I'm not going to sit here and lie. I could be, I could be praying a whole lot more. But you know, a lot of people don't want to be honest like that. They, you know, they feel like they're committed. Okay, well, you go ahead. I, I, I'm, I'm an honest person. I'm going to tell on me. Ephesians 6 and 5 says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and single, singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Be committed. Be committed to whatever it is that you're doing. Be committed. Whether you're going to school, I believe God is saying, be committed to whatever it is that you're doing. Be committed to it. Hebrews 5, I mean, Hebrews 10 and 25 says, 
God wants us to be committed. And when he's saying committed, that means whatever comes, he wants you to be committed. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And it says not forsaken the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some. It's but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. I'm going to read that one more time because it says not forsaking. Do not forsake the assembly of, of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day coming. And the problem with, with us is because it's a whole bunch of jealousy going on. People are just being thrown out there without no direction. I'm, I'm dead serious. People are being ordained and, 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 and stuff all over the world. And people are being ordained and they're just being thrown out there with no direction where to go, what to do, or nothing. And then we wonder why people just falling off. Because we don't give them directions. We don't give them directions. As leaders, we're supposed to direct them and show them what to do, how to do it. Especially if you if you already done these things it, it, as a leader, if I already done certain things and I already did certain like like, you know, a lot of people may not know how to go get a business license. <clears throat> a lot of people may not know, know how to do a 501c3. And if you already accomplished those things as a leader and you're appointing leaders, you should be teaching them how to do that. You should have a class and show them how to do that. Just don't throw people out. Without a without a paddle and a boat and water, don't do that. Don't do that. It's not right. It's not right. Oh wow, wow! They can figure it out. No, did you? How did you figure? If, if God blessed you to figure it out, then you should be helping other people. But people will do that. Let them figure it out for themselves. Amen. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. You're not your own. But the Bible also teaches that the chief com commitment of our lives is the God himself. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. With all of your mind. And this is the great commission. Matthew 22 37 and 38 that you should love God with all of your heart with all of your might love him you can't go wrong loving God that's why a lot of relationships fall because people fall in love with the person and and they put them first before God and then they they, they you know once you put people first I love you so much but you know you better be loving God more than you loving that person because that person can change that person can their heart can change they may not decide that they don't want to be with you. Then what? And one thing I've learned, anytime you put anything above God, you're probably going to lose it anyway. Anything you put above God is probably you're going to lose it anyway. Anything you make a God, that's a problem. That's a problem. Jesus is warning in advance. The reason for such commitment and loyalty is that the trials may have to endure will be quite demanding. So, here it is again. God is saying be committed to him because some of the trials could be very demanding. Our allegiances to him at times may be uh, adorious. Let's see what that says in John 15. Jesus alert his disciples. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If you, if they persecute me, they will also persecute you. The Apostle Paul echoed his warning. Indeed, all who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So when we get persecuted, we like, oh my God, why is this happening? Because the Bible says if he was persecuted, yeah, people are fickle. If they were persecuted, what makes you think you're not? They didn't like him. What makes you think people are going to like you? They're not going to like you. They're not because you're the the the, uh, the 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 very essence of God. The Jesus lives in you. Yesterday we talked about that. 
That Jesus is in you, the victory. We talked about victory, how Jesus lives in you. And the more light that's shining out of you, people are not going to like you. Jesus made a plain cause of this uh, discipleship. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. So we talked a lot of people here be saying, oh, this is just going to be a, 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 nothing. You know, once you get saved, you just rebuke the devil. And this, no, it don't, it, it, no, you do rebuke the devil, but no, it ain't going to be no walk in the park. There's some situations that if God wasn't with me, I wouldn't have, met, I wouldn't have got through it. And then I have to make a decision. Am I going to quit? Am I going to throw in the towel? When I was younger in the Lord, I'm not going. I'm going to confess and tell y'all the truth. Every time I prayed, y'all, every time I went into spiritual warfare, the enemy would come after me like I, you would not believe. And every time he did that, I would stop praying. I literally would stop praying because the attacks were so severe that I would stop praying. But this when I was younger. I would stop praying. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I can't. It's too much. But now that I'm in the Lord and I've been in the Lord a long time now, I'm like, nah, I'm not backing up. I'm not backing down. I'm not doing anything. I'm going to press, press, press through. And this is how we got to be. We got to press through. Because if you don't press through, every time the enemy attacks you and you back down, it's showing you that you're weak. That you're, you, 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 you're not standing. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Luke 9, 23 and 24. Let's read that. It says, and he said to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. And for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Internet issues. Sorry, you guys. So we have to lose our life in order to be saved with Jesus. We we have to. And people say, oh, you know, you're not going to go through this and that. No, you go through it. You go through it. I promise you. God is there. He's not going to leave you. There, He might pull his hand. He might pull away, but he's always there. He's always there. Hold on a second, you guys. Let me... um. Don't pull away. Stay in the fire. Stay in the fight. In essence, the true cause of commitment to Christ is one's total self-denial, cross-bearing, and continue following him. These um, impertinent tips, pictures of us, sacrifices, selfishness, and services. Across ultimate punishment, y'all, and I'm going to tell you something. Folks be lying and the church be lying, and I'm going to tell you something. You can lie to God. I mean, you can lie, but some people know you're lying. I'm telling you. Some people know you're lying. I'm telling you. I'm going to tell you straight up. You be lying, and God knows, and I know. I be knowing when people be lying. I don't say nothing. I just be like, Lord have mercy. I know when they lying. Straight be lying. You need to get rid of that lying demon. For real. Because you're crying wolf, and one day you're going to be telling the truth, and nobody ain't going to believe you. Folk be straight lying. God bless you, uh, Shamira. They be lying. They tell lies. But you got to be able to discern when they're lying, when they're telling the truth. That's why you got to seek the Lord so you know. Christ have redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us on the cross. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. So he... Galatians 3 and 13 says that he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every man on one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promises of the Spirit through faith. So this walk is a faith walk. I don't care what you're going through. You're going to have to be committed to God. You're going to have to just buckle down. You're going to have to tell God to, 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 usually I'll be like, Lord, just sit on me. Just put your arms around me. Don't let me go left. Don't let me go right. 
More than that, it fully demonstrates the love of God. Selfishness and sacrificial and the giving of his life for the world. If God was to tell some of us right now to go go put our take our son and put him outside and and and, and on, on a uh, build a fire and throw him in the fire, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do. We would not do it because that would be the the, the trust. Will you trust me? We will not do it. Paul followed the Lord's example of commitment and sacrifices and service. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We're talking about commitment. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that is Galatians 2 and 20. Let's read that. Which says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, I live, not I, but the Christ who liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So if he gave himself for, for us, we're going to have to give ourselves to him. We're going to have to be committed. Total commitment to God means that Jesus is our sole authority, our guiding light, and our urine compass. Being committed to Christ means being fruitful. It means being a servant. It's simple. Simple. For to live is, I'm sorry, for, for me to live is Christ. So we got to be fully committed to him no matter what we're going through, no matter what the circumstances is because if you don't be committed to God, you're not going to be committed to anything else. How are you going to be committed to, to something when you can't even be committed to God? Many Christians drag on in Christian life year after year and partial commitment, partial commitment, partial. How do we inherit eternal life? How do we inherit eternal life? How can we come to know God, the living God? We shall see the biblical teaching. The answers to questions are inseparably like to our commitment to God. We have to be committed. Committing is an action on our part in response to God. There is no point of talking about commitment unless we have at least the intention to commit. Our purpose then is to call forth a specific active response to God. And not just to increase our head knowledge. God bless you. God bless you, Ebony. Pastor Ebony, not head knowledge. It says we base this, we base the, the on the Bible, the word of God, and not on human ideas or opinions. We have to base it on Jesus, on the word, not on what we think, not on knowledge, on the word. That's why I always tell you guys to go into your word. Even when I prophesy, I say, if you go to God and still ask. Amen. We got to do that. I will base, it says, it says, we will base this book on the Bible, the word of God, and not on human ideas of opinion. Our goal is, is a breakthrough in our relationship with God. As for those who you have already made some kind of commitment to God, my hope is that any hindrances that may still stand between you and God will be removed. Father, we decree today that any hindrances that's in our lives, any aching that's in our lives, that it will be removed today so that we can serve you correctly, that we can commit to you, Father God, that we'll be committed. Every distraction will be removed today, that we be committed to you, Father, wholeheartedly. Many Christians drag on in the Christian life year after year and uh, partial commitment to God. But in the Bible, partial commitment is no commitment at all. And that's for those that, you know, they say, oh, you know, I love God, but, you know, they still going to the club. Let's talk about it because I've been there. I, I was I was not fully committed. They still going to the club. They still doing what they want to do, but they still saying they're committed. They're still got one foot in and one foot out, but they're still saying they're committed. Partial commitment is no commitment at all. If you're partially committed, you're not committed. You're not committed. The Bible says, be holy for I am holy. The Bible says, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We should not be putting certain things in our bodies. We shouldn't. 
But we make excuses. Oh, it's okay to do it until you catch cancer and die. If you're smoking and keep smoking, the next thing you know, you might get cancer. Oh, well, God wouldn't put that on me. Well, God didn't put it on you. You put it on you. You put it on you. You did that. Uh, you know, you, you are Christian, but yet you're still drinking. Some are still drinking so much that, you know, and then something happens, your liver is gone. Oh, I God put that on. No, God didn't stop blaming God for things that you put on yourself because you're the one that did it. He told you not to do those things, but you did it anyway. Just like he tells people not to fornicate. They go out and fornicate and they get STDs. He didn't tell you to go do that. The Bible told you not to do it, but you did it anyway. Then you come up with an STD and now you want to say, oh my God, God, God. No, no, you, 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 you did that when he told you not to. The Lord Jesus says, I wish that you were cold or hot. Revelations 3 and 15. Cold means turning away from God altogether. Yet in the mind of the Lord, that is not quite as bad as being lukewarm. One foot in and one foot out. Neither here nor there. You may be 80% up for God and 20% for the world. He requires of you nothing less than total commitment. Many Christians are crippled in their Christian lives because a half-hearted commitment. Half-hearted. I'm in. I'm not in. I'm going through. I'm out. I'm, I, I, you know, this back and forth stuff. I'm in when I'm doing good. I'm, I'm out when I'm doing bad. I noticed that, you know, Christians is like when you're doing good, you're, you're in. But soon as something happens, a trial comes and it's bad, then you're out. That's not commitment. You got to be in or out. Whether it's bad or good, you got to stay in it. They don't experience the joy and peace of the Christian life. They can't com communicate with God and God doesn't listen to their prayers. The problem is that their commitment has not been settled. They are not totally committed to God. So if you're not totally committed, don't play with him. Because he, the, the, the Psalms, it says he will turn a deaf ear to you. Let me find that scripture. He will turn a deaf ear to you. He will not hear you. And then when he don't hear you, then what you going to do? You're going to be mad, right? You're going to be mad. You're going to be blaming him for everything. There are people that blame God for things that he's sovereign. How dare you blame him for whatever is going on? If he chooses to do something, that's he knows. He knows. Honestly, I knew my my I knew that my my little dog, I knew she was going to pass. I knew. Can I just be honest and transparent? I knew. But I asked God to please give her a little bit more time. In my, in my spirit, I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. I knew, you guys, honest to God, I knew it was coming. I just kept like, Lord, please just give her a little, give her, can you please give her just a little bit more time with me? I knew. But the way God did it, he did it instantly. It was like boom, boom, bang. That's it. When he took her, he took her quick. He took her quick. But I knew it was coming. So some of you know stuff is coming. You already know in your spirit. You do know. I knew. I knew it was coming. I just was hoping that it was going to be a little bit longer than what it did. But God is a sovereign. He did what he wanted to do. But I knew it was coming. I knew she was going to be leaving. And, you know, God is sovereign. He did what he, he wanted to. He did what he needed to do. Because he's God. So, on the basis of God's word, there is simply no way to live the Christian life without total commitment. There's no, there's no reason. If you're, gonna, if you're not going to be committed, just don't do it. This is the fact of the matter. It is not a matter of theory, but a matter of reality and experience. You will discover yourself that the Christian life simply won't work if you don't commit totally to God. We wonder, God bless you, all I am. God bless you, woman of God. You know, and we say, you know, you know, we don't want to be committed. We'll say, you know, as soon as, like I said, something bad happens and then we're out. We, we can't be doing this wishy-washy stuff. We have to be committed. We have to be committed to God, no matter what. It says, does God answer your prayers? If he doesn't, then something needs to be 
store, uh, sorted out about your commitment. There are even people in full-time ministry who have committed commitment problems. But they realize this is only after entering the ministry. This is a miserable situation to be in. You may have given up everything to serve the Lord only to find out that you have no spiritual power, no joy, no fellowship with God. Holding back to little something for yourself will undermine your commitment. There's stuff going on like that in the church today. All in all, commitment has to do with the most important subject of all, our relationship with God. Good morning, Pastor Sherry, evangelist. And all commitment has to be do with most important subject of all is our relationship with God. What is your relationship with God? Because I'm going to tell you, if you die with Christ, you're going to live for Christ. That doesn't mean we're not going to have issues. That doesn't mean we're not going to be sick. That doesn't mean we're not going to have financial problems. But are you going to stick with God? Are you not, you're not going to give up, right? You're going to stay with him. The subject of commitment runs through the whole Bible. If you take up if you take it out of the Bible, we won't have any Bible left to read. Our commitment lies at the heart of our relationship with God. Even me, when I was a young Christian, no one told me about commitment. I did it. I did, however, have the advantage of knowing God in China at the time when it was dangerous to be a Christian. And when our pastors were being sent to labor camps, and we don't think it'll come to America. These people were sent to labor camps for being a Christian, for reading the Bible. We knew very well that without commitment, we would not survive as Christians. So why do we think because we in America, we can just do whatever we want to do and not be committed to God? Because a lot of, a lot of things in America, people are very spoiled here. Other countries, they don't have this this luxury that we have. They really don't. A lot of them really want to come here so bad. And some of them can't. They can't come. But they really want to be here. We knew very well that without commitment, we would not survive as Christians. So commitment to God was not something that the church had to spell out explicitly. When I finally arrived in Hong Kong, I said to myself, it is so wonderful to be in the free society where I can worship God and church or buy a Bible at a bookstore. But when I started visiting the churches there, I soon realized just how dead Christians were. My heart sank. I said to myself, this is freedom. These Christians have no life to in them. I simply couldn't fellowship with them about the Lord. I couldn't talk to them about the deep things of God or for the matter of elementary things. And I'm going to tell y'all some of our churches right now, like here is like that. That's why I don't, I go to church. I, I, I go, I go north. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not putting nobody down, but mm -mm. it's the same thing. The same thing y'all was preaching in 22. Y'all still preaching the same thing. I still talk about the same thing. When is it going to change? We're still talking about the same stuff. We still fighting the same demons we were fighting in 2022. I don't, I'm, I'm past that. Why are you still fighting the same demons? Huh? Got to ask yourself that question. Why are you still fighting that same spirit? I said this already. Well, I didn't say it, but the Holy Ghost said it. Some of your churches is being fought by witches. I'm telling you. And this is why people are sick all the time. This is why the battle has been so difficult. Because you got witches up in there and you don't have the power to cast them out. You don't. That's why they still there. They still there. Oh, Jesus, I feel you, Holy Ghost. Because you don't have the power to cast them out. You have the lips to say you can do it, but you don't have the power. You don't. Because if you did, it wouldn't be there. Jesus, help us. When I shared with them about what God had done in my life, they couldn't understand what I was talking about. They gave me a puzzled stare as though I had come from outer space. After hearing about our experiences of God, they would say to me, these things took place in the book of Acts, but not anymore. We're still doing it. We're still doing it. We're still doing it. God said, greater work shall you do. 
Greater works. Greater works shall we do. Greater works. Oh, no, I'm just going through because God's going to get a testimony. Some of that stuff is witchcraft, baby. Let me let me tell you. Let me let me be the one to tell you. Some of that stuff is witchcraft. Okay? Sorcery going on. Okay? Let's be let's just just get it out. Cuz you know when you come on this page, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm going to tell it like it, it is. The way God gets You got witches in the church P R E Y on you. Okay? That's what they're doing. They praying on you. So, if you don't understand the things of the Spirit, everything's going to be puzzled. That's why we've been learning about the glory of God. We've been learning about being in His presence. We've been learning about supernatural things because God wants us to operate in the supernatural. Supernatural is not the same as natural. We do not see the same things in the natural that we see in the supernatural. What, what's in the supernatural is, is everything that God has already put inside of you. Everything that God says you are. Everything that God says you can do. That's in the supernatural. In the natural, things may look crazy. Things may look like it's not going to happen. Like, um, hold on one second. Now, okay, we're back. But anyway, in the natural, everything you see is, 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 is the opposite. It's like, oh, you know, it's the opposite. But in the natural, it's not like that. In the natural, it may look it look one way, but supernaturally, God already told you you're vic you're victorious. God already told you you're gonna you're gonna make it. God already told you that no weapon for and against you is gonna prosper. God already told you that you're victorious in every situation. He already told you that you're gonna win. You're not gonna lose. That's in the supernatural. But we gotta learn to walk in that. Some of us are still walking in the natural. After hearing about our experience of God, they would say to me, these things took place in the Acts, but not anymore. Did you come straight out of the first century? That's what I'm saying. We're, we're still looking for things that happened two years ago when everything is not like that anymore. We're supposed to be walking in. We're supposed to be further along than where we are. Honestly. So I say, I say to myself, He's saying, I say to myself, what's happening here? I can't even fellowship with my fellow Christians. Because they don't understand. Carnal people don't understand supernatural things. And you could be a Christian and still be carnal. As I listen to the church sermons, I soon discern a lack of em emphasis on the deep matter of the, our relationship with God. When I conversed with some of, our past, some of the pastors, I felt that I was talking with some businessmen. They seem less interested in relationship with God and their church income or church property. They were consistently thinking about expanding their facility or that facility or doing outreach in order to expand the organization, much like a business trying to expand its matter. And I know exactly how this man felt because I feel like that a lot when I go to certain churches. I feel sick in my heart and wonder what exactly was the problem. There are some leaders that you know, you know, for a fact, there are people in your church who's been in your church forever that are sinning and you have not done anything to get them right. And I'm saying that because as leaders, you, if you see something wrong, you should call that person in privately, talk to them. You, you, you do everything you can to help them get out of that situation because sometimes you can get in places, places that you don't know how to get out. And the reason why it's like that is because some of the people that are in the church are afraid to go and tell what they're going through because some of you potty mouth. And I'm saying it to everybody, to, to those that are going to listen now. Some people have a potty mouth that they can't hold nothing. And when they come to you to tell you certain things, you go and tell other people. So God can't even trust you with somebody because if they come and tell you that they're they're doing something, I'll just use an example. They're a lesbian or they're a homeless, they're 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 um they're out here sleeping with men or whatever. You will literally eventually tell somebody. And then they're embarrassed. They want to be delivered, but they can't be delivered because you can't hold your mouth. Yeah, and I'm talking to leaders. Yeah. 
They share it with you and you're going to share it with your spouse. They didn't share it with the spouse. They, they came to you. You're not to go tell your spouse anything. You take that to the Lord. Yeah, or come out in a sermon. You preach on them. That's what you do. And it's wrong. If they have that certain problems, pray, pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Just pray for them. Pray for them. We're all guilty, love it, including me at, at, at some point in the past. We all guilty. Father, forgive us. Because we are. We are all guilty of it. At some point in our lives, we've done it. For a long time, I couldn't pinpoint the problem. But as I waited on the Lord for an answer and examined what the Bible may have to say about it, I began to see that the root problem was a lack of commitment. A lack of commitment. People in our so-called free society are not interested in committing to God. The church's failure to teach commitment has resulted in the dead churches of all around us. And that's true. She said ex that exactly what is done. That's what they do. They do that. How can God trust you? And then people calling you for help and you won't answer your phone? You ignoring them? You know, and they've been faithful to your ministry? Faithful. Been coming. Faithfully giving. And then they call you for help and you won't answer. Demonic. Straight demonic. I call it demonic. You demonized. That's what you demonized. God had mercy on you, but you won't have mercy on nobody else. You demonized. You're demonized. Like it or not, I'm saying it. You're demonized. It's crazy. The church fell to commit. There's a result of dead churches all around us. Wherever I raise the subject of commitment, many would say to me, if you talk about commitment, no one will go to church or become a Christian. Exactly. If you talk about they're going to go to hell, they won't come. Well, you're going to go to hell if you keep living the life you live in. The wages of sin is death. Yeah, how can God trust you? He can't. He cannot. And, and a lot of it, too, with me, is I couldn't go to nobody. I couldn't go to nobody. And it's sad, y'all. That's sad. You can't go to nobody and tell them, really, what's in your heart. And sometimes you do need somebody to talk to. You need to go to somebody. They tell you, go to the psychiatrist. No, I'm going to talk to you. You're my pastor, right? I'm paying tithes and offerings to you. I want you to talk to me. I want to be able to come to you freely and talk to you. But I can't. Because you got an unfruitful mouth. You're going to go tell it to somebody. To somebody. So we don't want to talk about commitment because it's going to run people off. But if you're going to leave, leave. I'm not going to stop preaching what God told me to preach because you is making you uncomfortable. I'm sorry that you're uncomfortable. That is not my problem. That you uncomfortable. The word of God says. It will not return to him. Boy, but it will go out and accomplish that. What it sent out to do. The word of God will set you free. So I'm not going to not preach. What God's telling me to preach. To make you comfortable. That's not what I'm going to do. Or make you feel good. I want to preach and teach. What's going to set you free. And get you delivered. Because that's what God called me to do. He said my word. Word deliverance. God's word deliverance. His word will deliver you. I don't have to lay hands on you. His word himself will deliver you. Honest to God. Whenever I raise the subject of commitment, many say to me, if you talk about commitment, no one will come to church or become Christians. The cost is too high. To this, I would answer, but commitment is taught everywhere in the scripture, which it is. That is why we look into the Bible to see what it says about commitment. Don't accept what I say out of my own opinion. I say this all the time. See your, for yourself what the Bible teaches about it. The Bible teaches not just commitment, but total commitment. Total, fully, completely committed. Both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Total commitment is the foundation of our relationship with God. Commitment is sometimes stated explicitly, other times implicitly. In the latter case, that the statement will make sense 
only in relationship to commitment. If you remove the element of commitment from it, the sentence will lose its meaning. You have to be committed. You have to be committed. What is an expected statement? Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, can't even say it right. Second language, sorry. Deuteronomy 6, 5 to 7. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Love the Lord with all of your heart. Whether you are asleep or awake or outside of the house or inside, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul and with all of your strength. That is total commitment, plain and simple. That the Israelites are to love God with their entire being is repeatedly in Deuteronomy eleven thirteen. So if you faithfully obey the commandments, I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. The principle is reaffirmed in the New Testament and in the every teaching of Jesus Christ. Matthew 22 and 37. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. Therefore, in both Old Testament and New Testament, total commitment finds expression in loving the Lord our God with our whole being. You got to love him with your whole being. Your whole being. Your whole being. Does the word commitment or the verb commit occur in the Bible or are we merely fabricating it? That a word absent in the Bible does not necessarily mean that it is scripturally untrue. Some biblical concepts are accurately expressed by words that are not found in the Bible. An example is a scarement, an important word that refers to baptism and communion, yet is not found in the Bible. Sacrament. Another word is atonement, an important word used by the church to refer to what was accomplished by Christ's death. He died to atone for, to pay for our sins in order to reconcile us to God. And the King James or authorized version in the Bible, atone occurs only once in the New Testament in Romans 5.11. And let's go there. I don't know who this is for, but God keeps saying, you better stop lying. I don't know who this is for, but it's in, it's on my face. Stop lying. Why do you keep lying? I don't know who this is for. Stop lying. Jesus. God is saying, stop lying because this is going to catch up on you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to slap you in the face. Whatever it is you're lying about is going to catch up on you. Jesus. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received an atonement. We received an atonement from God. He died on the cross for us. He died to atone for, to pay for our sins in order to reconcile us to God. And the King James authorized version, we read that, Romans 5.11. Modern Bibles are more far likely to use the word reconciliation. And this verse, the, the word atonement, may or may not be in your version of the Bible. Yet it expresses the eternal truth of what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. As for the word commitment, it is found in the Bible, Psalms 31 and 5 says, unto your hands, I commit my spirit, redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth, the NIV version. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he said, Father, unto your hands, I commit my spirit. Luke 23 and 46, committing on self or one spirit to God means to entrust on self entirely to him. Psalms 37 and 5 says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. Again, the basic idea is, is to entrust. To entrust means to put something into somebody's care. To commit one's spirit to God is to put one's own life. 
one's own spirit into God's care. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established and trust all your work and activities to God so that he may cause them to bear fruit according to his will. We got to keep praying. We got to keep praying for our businesses. Lay hands on your business. Keep speaking it. It will prosper. It will go world. It will go global. It will go. In the name of Jesus, I decree it so. I see it happening. It's happening. Even though it's not moving, nothing's happening. Nobody's purchasing anything. Nothing's happening. You keep speaking it. Because I guarantee you the word of God will catch up with it and it will happen. Clearly, the word commitment doesn't belong to the category of theological words such as segment or atonement. Yeah, you got to keep speaking it even if you don't see it. I don't care. I don't care if it's not moving. You start speaking that thing. You start calling that thing to be blessed. You call it to be global. You call it to everything to be aligned with the will of God. That I shall prosper. I'm an entrepreneur. You gave me this idea. You gave it to me, God. I didn't I didn't come up with this. This is something you gave me. Because you gave it to me, I know that you're going to make it happen. I know that you're going to cause it to prosper. I know that it's going to go global. I know that the finances are coming in for me to do what I need to do. I know that the people are coming to purchase the things that I need, you, need to be purchased. I know that you're sending my my helpers i know that you're sending my helpers are coming my financial helpers my business helpers whatever helpers you need and you don't stop speaking it into it comes to pass just because it didn't come to pass yet last week or last month it doesn't matter you you speak it until it happens my son is coming home and i've been speaking that for six years and he is coming and I won't stop saying that. He ain't doing no 23 years. I cancel that assignment in Jesus name of the enemy. I cancel it. It won't take no 23 years for God to do what he needs to do. Hello? Hello? We got to get like that and let the devil know you ain't got nothing. You can't stop nothing. You can't do, especially if God told you, especially if God gave it to you. He gave you that idea, don't you stop. Step back off of it. I'm going to keep speaking it. I'm prosperous. My business is going to flourish. Even the more. Even the more. We got to keep speaking it. Until you see it. Manifest. God may manifest it soon. May he manifest it later. But sometimes God is trying to see your faith. Do you believe me? Oh yeah he's coming. I already know he's coming. And I'm going to tell you why. So we hired an attorney for him. And I knew, I knew as soon as we dropped off the check, I knew. In my spirit, I said, the enemy is getting ready to attack my son. <laughs> he did. It wasn't bad or anything, but I knew it. I knew. I said, the enemy is coming for him. He's going to come with something. You understand? For, for some, some, some retaliation. But the devil is a liar. God bless you, Sandra. He's a liar from the pits of hell. No weapon for and against him is going to prosper. Now come against every spirit of retaliation in Jesus' name. The devil is a liar. But you got to keep speaking that thing. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You speak that thing into existence. You speak it into existence. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established and trust all your works and activities to God so that he may cause them to bear fruit according to his will. Clearly the word commit doesn't belong to the category of theology, words of sacrament and atonement in terms of its presence, absences in the Bible. The fact is that commit is used frequently in the ver various English translations of the Bible. Example from the New Testament found in 1 Peter 4 and 19. Let's look at 1 Peter 4 and 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him and doing good as to faithful creator. Here, the Greek Word translated, soul means life. To save your soul is to save your life. To lose your soul is to lose your life. To commit your soul to God, as in the verse, is to commit your life to God. This is fact. It is the uh, spiritual principle of faith in God. By faith, we entrust ourselves to God. It is not just a matter of believing in certain doctrines. 
Yes, they, they just like they said. Uh, 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 they told Noah. Noah was looking crazy, right? He was building that, that that boat, and they kept telling him, "Why are you building the boat? Why are you building the boat? It ain't gonna rain. It ain't gonna rain. It ain't gonna rain." And Lord and behold, if it rained, and all of them die. So it doesn't matter what people are saying. What I'm trying to say to you today by the Spirit of God is, it doesn't matter what people are saying. It doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what they're saying. You walk by faith and not by sight. I don't care what's coming your way. You trust God for his word. His word was, is true and his word will not lie. His word is truth. If he said you are prosperous, he are prosperous. If he said he's giving you power to attain wealth, then he's giving you power to attain wealth. If he said you're the head and not the tail, then that's who you are. If he says the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want that. That's what he means. That's what he means. If he said he will spread a table before you in the presence of your enemies, that's what he's going to do. He's not going to back down from his word. He's not a man that he should lie. The son of man that he should have to repent. He will not repent. He doesn't, he doesn't lie. He can't lie. He can't. Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. You will trust in him. It said they were looking crazy in the end. They were looking crazy because that, wa that water done swarmed them up. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisy pestilence. I don't know what you're going through, but God is saying he's going to deliver you from the noisy pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. His truth, not my truth, not what people say, his truth. That's in the word of God. Thou shall, be a, thou shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Doesn't matter what the enemy's doing. Doesn't matter what arrows he's throwing at you. You shall... Not fear. Thou shalt not be afraid. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. Nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand. Listen to this right here. A thousand may fall at thy side. And ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come nigh thee. Only with your eyes shall thou behold. The, uh, I'm sorry. Behold and see the reward of the wicked. You will behold with your eyes of the wicked. You're going to see it. A thousand. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at the right hand. Can you believe that? You go, You got a, a, a thousand over here and 10,000 over here and they can't win. Only with your eyes thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord which is your refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. God bless you, Maisha. You may guide your habitation. They shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. No plague. If it comes, it doesn't matter. You stand on the word. The Bible says you are healed by his stripes. You are healed by his stripes. Healing is the children's bread. He'll give his angels charge. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands. Least thy foot, least dash thy foot against a stone. You are not going to fall. You're not going to fall. You're not going to fall. Thou shalt tread upon a lion and utter and young lion and the dragon shall thy trample under your feet. The devil is under your feet. He's under your feet. Remember that. He's always under your feet no matter what he's doing. He's under your feet. Because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. He's going to deliver you. I don't know when. But your faith is going to have to be at work for that. You're going to have to believe. Believe for the impossible. He shall call upon my name. And I will answer him. 
I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me. You call upon God and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. God is never going to leave you, but you're going to have to be committed. We got to be committed to God. We want God to do all these things for us, but we got one foot in and one foot out. And God says he reigns of the just as well as the unjust. He has mercy on who he wants to. But I'd rather just be committed and know that I'm committed and know that if something happens, I know that I'm okay. I don't have to wonder, is he going to do it? Is he not going to do it? Because I'm half in and half out. If I'm all the way in, I know he's going to help me. Because his word said so. Right? His word said so. When people are half in and half out, they don't know, oh, you think he'll do it? He might do it. Maybe he'll do it. No, I know he's going to do it. I know that if I speak something, he's going to do it because I am committed. I am a hundred thousand percent committed to him, to him, not the people, to him. This is facts. <clears throat> Believing with all your heart that an elevator can take you up is fundamental, different from your actual stepping into it. If you don't step into the elevator, you won't go up. Even if you were believed with all your heart that it can take you up. So what is God saying? Move by faith. Move by faith. Oh, I don't have the money. God don't care about your money. God says move. Just do it. I'll supply. Just do it. We, we waiting for, we waiting with the money. With no money. How am I going to, God says just move. You take one step, God's going to take about three or four. He got cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. You think he don't have people out here that can bless you? He don't think he ain't got multimillionaires and, and billionaires out here that he can put your name and your, your address on their mind? Hello? Believe for those type of things that can happen. To entrust means to trust into and entrusting yourself to an elevator. You don't believe that it can take you up. You actually let it carry you up, right? You get in the elevator and the elevator, you know, you got to go through the third floor. How are you going to get there? If, if Say if there's no stairs, you're going to have to let the elevator take you up, right? Likewise, you are not saved merely by believing that God can save you. The devil also believes that God has a plan of salvation, but that won't save him. The demons believe that God is one, yet they tremble. James 2.19. Let's look at James 2.19. They tremble. Don't rejoice because you can cast out a demon. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. Anybody can cast out a demon. You can cast out a demon. If you're, if you're living holy. If you if you if you in and out, don't try it. Okay? Don't try it because some demons will talk to you and let you know, uh, you know, where you've been and what you've done and you ain't touching me. I was at... um. I was at Revelation Church one, one Thursday and I was talking to a man. He was a pastor and he told me, he said he was in another country. No, he wasn't in another country. He was in, in New York. And he said that um, he, he was doing a revival there. And the man, <laughs> he said the man, there was a spirit was being cast out. And the, 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 the preacher said, well, are you going to cast out? God did it. I need my business names all over the world. Yes. Yes, he did. Yes, yes, he is. He's going to do it because he said it. Um, so the man was like, uh, told him to cast out the devil, cast out the demon out of the person. And the demon said, oh, he, he ain't going to cast me out. He, he not going to cast me out because he, he's sleeping with that lady right there. So he got a wife right here and he's sleeping with this lady right here. So they'll tell on you. Don't play around, okay? Don't play around. Because that devil will call you out. If you're doing something, you ain't got no business, you're going to get called out. They believe it's that there is one God, thou doest well. The devil also believes and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith with thy works is dead? God wants you to have faith. He wants you to be committed and committed and be faithful. And have faith in him that he will do what he says he's going to do. Amen. To be saved, you have to believe God in such a way as to commit yourself to him. And the Bible translation 
And trust is the word found in 1 Peter 4, 19 and in other verses such as 1 Timothy 1 and 18 and 2 Timothy 1 and 2 and 22. The Lord Jesus committed himself to God, his father, and trusting his spirit to him. When he suffered, he died for us. 1 Peter 2 and 23, when they hurtled their insults at him and there's people that's doing that to us, talk about us. I know people talk about me and say all kinds of stuff and I don't care. But I bet you won't step to me because if you got a spirit on you, I promise in Jesus name, I'm going to call it out and cast it out. But my, not my power, but in the power of Jesus. Yes, for real. They won't come in my face with that, that, that demonic spirit though. They won't. When they heard of their insults to him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Okay, so we got to commit ourselves to God. Totally commit yourself to him. Totally be committed to God. Commit. Don't be in and out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Don't be in and out. Don't be in and out. Undecisive what you want to do. You want to be committed today. I don't want to be committed tomorrow. No, be committed. There is very, it's power. It's, it's very powerful to be committed to God. It's power. It's very powerful to be committed to God. There's power in commitment. Very, very powerful to be committed to him. Power of commitment. Is a living sacrifice and humble service. We got to do it. We don't have another way to do it. We have to do it. Commitment is a, a glue that bounds you to your goals. Commitment is what transforms a promise into a reality. Dreams are what makes life worth living, but it is commitment to the relentless pursuit of your goals that turns dreams into reality. A dream without commitment is a car without fuel. So you have to be committed. It means to be faithful, loyal to a certain cause. Be faithful to whatever God's giving you. Be responsible for what he's giving you. We are committed when we make a deliberate and unchangeable choice about something and stick to it and don't give up. In other words, if your business is failing, so what? It's not failing. It's not failing. God is just preparing you for more. You speak that thing. You speak the opposite. No, you're not failing. You're not. And you let the devil know, <laughs> okay, it looks like this. But God said this. So if God said this, I'm going to believe God, not you, Satan. So the devil will expose your business. That's how he keeps people bound after God has forgiven them. Yeah, he, he'll do that. He, he's just, he messy. Who cares? He's a liar is what he is. And he's going to hell. He don't have a choice. That's where he's going. And he's going to try to take as many as he can, including Christians. There are Christians that are really going to go to hell. Christians that have been serving God this whole time. Ministers, leaders that are going to go to hell for real. Seriously, this is not a joke. If they don't turn from their wicked ways, that's where they're going. That's where they're going to go. To commit to to be committed is to express diligence towards something. Be 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 fast, be, be steadfast on it. Willingness to pay any price. If a person is committed to the call of God, he will be willing to pay any price to fulfill that call. You are a co-worker with God and a worker is required to work. God may call you to make sacrifices in order to unfold his purpose in your life. And that means giving. Giving. Giving is part of you making it in if you didn't understand. Prayer, fasting, and giving. Giving is big on, with God. Giving. I'm telling you. The person who is committed is willing to overcome all obstacles to keep that commitment. He doesn't quite easily and is not looking for a convenient way out. There is no convenient way out. If there isn't. When the person is committed, he will be focused and not easily distracted. Don't be, be distracted by the things that are God that the devil is bringing to you. But one who is co not committed to anything will just drift along and go where it is convenient. And that's what's happening to a lot of churches. You're somewhere where it's convenient. It's convenient to go and hear the same prophetic word every single time. It's convenient to go and just sit there and not do the work, but you're just sitting there, but you're not doing the work that you're supposed to do because you're sitting there waiting for somebody to give you words. 
You have to do the work. You're not ever going to see exploits, greater works, if you don't do the work. We are called to commit ourselves as disciples. Disciples are learners. We should never reach a point in life at which we are no longer learners. We are learners. I'm still learning. I'll sit up on it. Anybody. I'll sit up on the Revelation Church because I'm learning. I'm learning. I will never think that I know everything because I don't. I will never get to that point. Yeah, they say one thing and do another. I'm telling you. It's crazy. Philippians 3, 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus told, uh, took hold of me. Let me read that one more time. Philippians 3, 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You may not be there, but you better keep speaking that faith. 1 Corinthians 3 and 2. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. Some people are still drinking milk. Intellect. Pursuit of a border wisdom. Spiritual. Commitment to develop our heart, institution, peace of mind, and, ex and to become Christ-like. We are supposed to be Christ-like. We're supposed to become like Christ. And the way you do that is by committing to him, commitment to improve health and fitness. It's, it all, your physical body is involved. Your emotion is involved. Commitment to improve self-control, patience, love, integrity, and peacemaking skills. All those come together. Emotion, physical, intellect, and spiritual. It's all one thing. And a, a continuous improvement of personal growth. Change is a consistent thing in this world. By making this commitment, we are also asserting that we are going to help guide that change. So it brings us more good than bad. Personal growth won't work for people seeking stability. People who want to just make a quick change and keep everything else the same won't be able to make permanent changes. You have to want to make changes. It may not feel comfortable, but you need to make that change. Some of you are stuck because you, 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 you're, it's convenient. You feel comfortable and you won't move. And God is saying move, but you won't move. And he, you can't grow because you won't move. Second step to, uh, to start making those small improvements we see does not need to huge. They just need to be consistent. That's when you have to act on it. By keeping the steps small by and noticeable, we can make lasting changes. Evaluate. Evaluate. What went right? What things did you, you improve this week? Take one day at a time. What went wrong? What things could you improve next week? What now? And I hear the Lord say, some of you are doing too much. Too much. You can't stick to one thing because you got 50 things going on. This thing, that thing, that thing, that you, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't do it like that. You have to concentrate on one thing, whatever it is you, one thing at a time. You're trying to do this and you're trying to be an entrepreneur this and an entrepreneur that and an entrepreneur you can't even concentrate on. You got to be consistent to one thing. Once that one thing makes it, then you go to the next. You can't be doing a thousand things and think all of it's going to work. Be consistent to one. Gradually improve is generally fairly hard to see in the short term, but huge in the long term. By evaluating our progress, we can allow ourselves to see this little improvement. Measure. Simply by measuring something, we have to have a lot better grasp over our effectiveness and efficient, uh, efficiencies with it. Whatever is measured improves. Commitment to your local church. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Local church with its imperfections is still the Lord's major avenue through which he accomplished his work. Let me read that again. Local church with, with all its imperfections is still the Lord's major avenue through which he accomplished his work. Hebrews 10 and 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another. 
on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And we're, we're in that day. The local church is a central part of God's strategy plan for your spiritual growth. Jesus said, on this rock, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not be able to stand against it. But you're the church. Remember that. Yes, you're supposed to go to a building. You're supposed to fellowship. But never forget that you're the church. The church is in you. You are basically a composite. A comp I'm sorry. Comp Post it of the li the five living with whom you spend the most time with. You are basically a com comp composite of the five people whom you spend the most time with. It is important, therefore, that we choose those people well. That is why it is so valuable for us to be in church every time the doors are open. Paul said it like this, but encourage one another daily as as it is called today, so that one, I'm sorry, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Hebrews 3 and 13. We need the support of one another, believers, if we are truly going to grow in Christ. We need the voice of the church to encounter, interact all of the deception that is crammed up into our minds. Paul warns believers in Colossians 2 and 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through uh, philo philo philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of man according to the basic principles of the world not according to Christ that's why we need to read our word and I'm gonna it's so much more I guess I'll, I'll continue to do it tomorrow with this but um, there's so much more oh actually it's not that much more let me just let me just go here 1 Corinthians 12, 4, 7, and 11. Ministry means putting those gifts to work. All of you are gifted. Don't let nobody tell you you're gifted, okay? I don't, don't let nobody tell you nothing. You're gifted, but God wants your commitment. 1 Corinthians 12, 4, and 7, and 11. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. The same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of services, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he is, he distributes them to each one just as he determines. We must commit ourselves to the ministry of local churches and use the spiritual gifts that God has given us. Some of you are afraid to speak up. Some of you, God has shown you some stuff and you're afraid to speak up because you're afraid to be rejected. Do you want to be rejected by God or man? You sit in there. Oh, I'm praying. No, you be to speak up. Speak up. Commitment to the ministry builds up spiritual muscle. When we use our spiritual gifts by serving within the local church community, community, we somehow become better grounded theologically. It will be more difficult for us to be deceived into thinking things that are not true according to God's word. Serving makes more theological astitude. Commitment is what strips away the excuses and makes you get serious about God because God is serious about you and he's committed to you. Success. God wants you to be committed. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to commit everything. Let me read this little thing to y'all. It says, Susie, I love you so much. I will climb the highest mountain, cross the uh, driest desert, sail the most tempest seas. See you Sunday. See you Sunday. It, do, it, it says, if it doesn't rain, if it doesn't rain, see you Sunday. I love you so much. I will climb the highest mountain across the highest, the driest desert, sail the most temp, uh, tempest seas. See you Sunday. If it doesn't rain, that's not commitment. Whether it rains, you go to work when it rains, but when it, when it's time to go to church and it's raining, you don't want to go. I'm guilty because I'm not driving two and a half hours in the rain because I've already been in an accident in the rain and I'm sorry, but I can't. 
it, it, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's not using wisdom. Honestly, you got to use wisdom. But you see what he's saying to her? He told her he loved her. And this is what we tell God. We love you, Jesus. Oh, God, we love you so much. God, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. But then when God asks us to do something, we talk about we'll do it if, if, we, if, if. No, it's not no if. We got to do it if he tells us to do it. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. What time is it? Okay. Father, we thank you for uh, for us being committed to you. Father, we thank you, Father, for all that you're doing. We thank you for your word. We thank you for those that are on here, God. We thank you for the different dimensions of glory that we're going to go into. We thank you, Father, for your word. Your word will not return to you void. I pray that every word that was spoken today, every scripture, Father God, that it would just stay on us. Let us be like sponges. Father, let us retain your word in our spirit, Father, that we may not sin against you, God. We meditate on your word. So we may not sin against you, Father. Help us, Lord. Help us to be committed to you like never before. Now we're on chapter 8, Dimensions of Glory. From glory. But we all with unveiled faces, behold is a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. The Word of the Lord tells us that we are change from glory to glory hello sorry you guys internet it's tripping so again by we by all it says but we all with unveiling faces behold as a mirror to the glory of the lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the lord second corinthians 3 and 18 the word of god tells us that we are changed from glory to glory as we are progressing trans formed into the image of God. In the same manner, we will are individually transformed. We then alter everything around us after the pattern of the kingdom of God. How does God transform us? By his spirit. If you don't have his spirit, you're not going to be transformed. You got to have his spirit. Every part of our lives should be permeated by his goodness and bathed in his presence. Every good word we speak should flow from that river within us. A river of life and abundance. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. Going from glory to glory. It simply means growing into the different dimensions of God's glory. When we are children. Our worlds are very small. We have less worries. Fewer responsibilities. And our understanding is limited. But as we move from childhood to young adult. And then on to adulthood. Our world expands dramatically. We add understanding, knowledge, responsibilities, freedoms, and slowly the whole world opens up to us. This is similar to growing from glory to glory. As you in dimensions of the glory of God, you realize that the kingdom of God is vest and the possibilities are endless. And oh, this, this internet is tripping y'all. Glory from glory is simply growing differently. Ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Christ has no body now but yours christ has no body you don't have anyone you're it no hands no feet on earth but yours yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world yours are the feet which with which he walks to do good yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world yours are the hands yours are the feet yours are the eyes you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. You're it. As children of the living God, you and I are called to transform the earth. We are commissioned to go into the brokenhearted, the sick, and the wounded, and to those in bondage to the enemy's devices in order to administrate freedom and restoration. Now then, we are assemblers for Christ. As, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ behalf be reconciled to God for he made him who knew no sin to be the sin for us that we might become the righteous of God and him second Corinthians 5 20 and 21 the Bible calls us ambassadors for Christ the Miriam Webster dictionary defines ambassador as a diplomat agent of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government so we are a foreigners here this is not our this is not where we're going to end up. We're foreigners. 
Let me read that again. Ambassador as a diplomat agent of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government. So then you and I are residents of the kingdom of heaven and endowed on this earth with authority to exercise and administrate God's will. That may lead you to ask what exactly is his will. Let's look at the scripture. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Matthew 9, 35. When Jesus walked the earth, he proclaimed the goodness of God and the kingdom of heaven, demonstrating the power of God by healing and the sick and delivering those who were in bondage to the enemy. That is God's will that we would walk as Jesus walked as sons and daughters of the living God, possessing and demonstrating great peace, power, and authority. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 9, and 10. Jesus prayed the Father's will will be ex executed on earth just as it is in heaven. This means that sickness should be eradicated and sent packing because there is no sickness in heaven. No one is stressing over finances in heaven. No suffering with depression. All of these things are work of the devil. God has given us the power to take authority over these things. As we are transformed body, soul, and spirit into the image of his glory, these things will begin to live out of our lives. How are you going to do that? Praying, fasting, being in his presence. The first dimension of glory, the abiding glory. Every born believer has received an abiding glory. This means that the day you were born again, the spirit of God moved into you and made your body, the spirit, his habitation. The glory of God dwells within you, just as it did in the Ark of the Covenant. Every Christian has an abiding glory like a hidden treasure within them, a river of living water ready to burst forth. Do you not know that you are the temple of the spirit of God dwells within you? God is in you. So remember, when you're going out to steal, he's there. When you're going to fornicate, he's there. When you're drinking your alcohol, he's there. Oh, he's there. He's there. Think of your spirit. When you're lying, he's there. He's there. And he's having mercy and trying to get you to stop doing that. Think of your spirit as God's throne room. That rim of the holy of holies no longer resides in a temple, an ark, or any building constant, uh, constru constructed from man's hands. But that perfect Holy Spirit lives within you, intertwining himself with your spirit. The Bible says that we are members of his flesh and bones. Ephesians 5 and 30. Let's look at Ephesians 5 and 30. Because the scripture is not on here. Ephesians 5 and 30 says. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. It says. For, for you have been born again, that is reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart from his purpose. Not of the seed which is perishable, but from that which is imperishable and mortal, that is through the living and everlasting word of God. 1 Peter 1 to 23. God is trying to take us to a whole nother dimension, y'all. He's trying to take us to a place where you will be able to speak those things as not as though they are. You will be able to minister to those, go deep, deep, deep into their spirit and minister to them. The word of knowledge is gives you birth dates, gives you names, addresses. That is the word of knowledge. And after the word of knowledge comes prophecy. That's how it works. We read about that. We talked about that. That's what the Bible says. You and I are partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1 and 4. This means that God's very nature dwells within us. Each and every believer receives his glory that abides and resides within you. Your citizenship has changed. No longer are you and I citizen of this word. Your DNA has changed. You have the DNA of the Father. 
tied to the carnal nature that we received when we were born. Rather, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Remember, you are not, you're seated in heavenly places. You've been raised up, resurrected from the dead, and given a new name and a new identity. Everything within you is being pulled up by God in power for a greater work and for a greater reason. God is trying to take you to a higher level. You may not even be aware of all that God has placed inside of you. Every one of us who is seeking more of him through his word is constantly growing in the knowledge of the depths of the power of, and in glory. You're not going to get it unless you seek him. How does God reveal to us the greatness of this abiding glory and how do we access it? Think about a safe con uh, containing $1 million. It is hidden in your house. If you aren't aware of its presence, then it might as well not be there. Likewise, if you don't know the combination, you can't access it. But understand this, the spirit of God within you is more precious than any earthly treasures or monetary gain. In order to access this abiding glory, it takes revelation. Revelation is simply an unveiling of the na nature of God and the operations of his kingdom. If we seek him out, God will reveal hidden and secret and sacred things to us through his word. Revelation can come to us in many ways. It can come to us as we are studying the logos, his word. Logos is the living and the written word of God. It can come as a rima word which is utter or spoken word directly from the Lord. Sometimes the word speaks to us through our people, through other people, which unveils parts of God's kingdom to us that we have never seen or experienced before. God, giving, God even gives us dreams, visions, or encounters to deposit revelation of his spirit within us. Revelation unlocks the power of God. And faith is the medium that releases it to the world. Those two things go hand in hand. The second dimension. Okay, the second dimension. What time is it? Okay. The second dimension of glory, a personal atmosphere of God's presence. Remember, we talked about building an atmosphere. If you don't have an atmosphere for, for God's presence to be in your home, how is it going to be in your home? I constantly pray. I constantly play gospel music in my home. I constantly uh, uh, let prayer pray in my home. Like right now, there's music playing all the time. Always gospel music playing. Always worship music playing in my house. Always, always. Or, or at night when I go to bed, I, I find prayers that praise all night. For 10 hours. So by the time I wake up, it's still playing. I keep an atmosphere with the presence of God all the time in the house. We believers begin to commune spirit to spirit with the abiding glory within. An atmosphere of the presence of God begins to surround them like a cloud. In turn, the cloud begins to touch others. Even when I'm sleeping, I put my phone I go to YouTube. I'm just going to tell you. I go to YouTube and I find the book of Psalms or whatever book I want to put on there. And I let it pray through, pray all night. My spirit, I'm asleep, but my spirit is taking in the word all night long. All night long, my spirit is being filled. Because my spirit doesn't sleep. I sleep, but my spirit doesn't. So all night, I'm listening to the word of God. As an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, we are impotent. And if we walk around with the power of God within us. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me go back. Abiding glory within the atmosphere of the presence of God begins to surround us. I'm sorry. Let me start over. When believers begin to commune spirit to spirit with the abiding glory within an atmosphere of the presence of God begins to surround them like a cloud. In turn, that cloud begins to touch others. And ambassadors of kingdom of heaven, we are impotent if we walk around with the power of God within us. Without manifestation, we are called to be a sign and a wonder to a lost generation. David wrote, my cup runs over, Psalms 23 and 5. Your cup isn't just meant to be filled with God, but to overflow. Overflow. Let that glory overflow in your life. Let it touch others and set them free. Men and women should sense Sometimes different about you. 
Everything in your life should overflow. Your joy, your finances, the anointing and everything. King David was raised up as a symbol of the kingdom. We represent an eternal priesthood and the government of God. He points to the pattern of the kingdom and the lineage of covenant. David didn't necessarily fit the description of a king in the world's eyes. But God saw his devotion to worship and prayer. God has removed the priesthood of Saul, the arm of the flesh. God brought it an end to a day of operating out of the flesh and made a way for us to walk in the Davidic priestly anointing and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. And as I was reading that, the Holy Spirit brought something to me. And I heard somebody saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the word all day. I'm going to this person. And God said, that's not acceptable. He, he doesn't care. You're going from this person just because I'm teaching right now. Doesn't mean the rest of the day. I'm not going to get in my word. God wants you in your word because you're going from this platform to that platform and that platform. And you hearing the word does not mean you're not meditating. When are you meditating on the word? You're getting the word right now, but you still have to meditate on it. <laughs> and I heard the Lord say, I heard somebody say, well, I'm getting the word. I'm going from this platform to that platform. And God is saying, that is not acceptable. That's not what he wants you in his word. So he can meditate and talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. It's good that you're getting the lessons. It's good that you're getting the word. But even for me, just because I'm teaching right now doesn't mean that I'm not going to go get in my word later on. It's not, doesn't mean that I'm not going to read scriptures. I read scriptures all day. The Bible calls us kings and priests in the old covenant. The king will bring forth the offering, but only the priest would deliver it to the Lord. Now we are both kings and priests because we are in the new covenant with better promises. Some of you be on the phone all day talking about how sick you are and how this is going wrong. And I don't understand why my life is like this. Oh, I always oh, me, 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 me. I'm always going through. It's always something. You are speaking them things into your own presence. You speaking that to your own presence. You. You are speaking that. And something else the Lord showed me earlier that I, when I was praying that. Some of you think you're, God is talking to you, but it ain't God. It's a demonic spirit that's speaking to you. And you better make sure it's God. Because I see in the spirit, some of you are listening to the wrong voice. I'm, I'm seeing it in the spirit. I'm seeing it in the spirit. Some of you are listening to the wrong voice. It ain't God. It's not God. You ain't got to believe me. Go to God. Ask him. I'm just telling you what he's telling me. It's not him. You got to remember the enemy also knows things. He knows things. He knows things. And some of you always talking and he hears what you're saying. And then he comes and infiltrate it. And it ain't God saying it. It's him making it more because you don't know how to not say nothing. I speak to God from my heart. That way, what you going to say, Satan? You don't, you can't read my heart. You got to stop speaking. Some of you are speaking too much. And the devil is using that. It's a familiar spirit that's listening to what you're saying. And then you think it's him and it's not. You ain't got to believe me. Go to him. I'm just telling you what he said. The Bible calls us kings and priests and the old covenant. The king would bring forth the offering, but only the priest would deliver it to the Lord. Now we are both kings and priests because we are in the new covenant with better promises. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light. Our calling as a royal priesthood to a priesthood is a minister to the Lord. Jesus often withdrew the prayer, sometimes to the top of the mountain, sometimes a all all night long. Yeah, is your is the thoughts. That's right, Ebony, you right. It's the thoughts. And the enemy is planting that seed. He's the one that's planting in it. I heard the Lord say, some of you are not, it's not God. And even in the spirit, I could see them whispering in your ear. 
a dark shadow whispering in some of your ears. Lord, help us to understand and know your voice. Please help us today, oh God. We cancel every assignment of the enemy. We cancel every deception, every, every lie of the enemy in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of witchcraft, every familiar spirit, every spirit of projection. We cancel you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There are many Greek words for prayer that are used in the New Testament. And each describe a different function of prayer. However, all of these words translate as prayer in our English Bibles. One such word is, oh, pursuit, which translate as worship. Sometimes we overcomplicate our prayer. Yes, there is a place for thanksgiving, for intercession, and for supplication. But we must not forget to simply bow down before him and worship him. There is so much purity in simply basking in his presence. Allow him to wash over you and, t and be telling and telling him how good he is. A priest's first call is to minister to the Lord. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Acts 4.13 When you have spent time with Jesus, you carry the aroma of heaven. In this scripture from Acts 4, the Jewish leaders recognized that Peter and John had been with Jesus. Was it their background that caused them to know this? Was it their education, formal training, or credentials? No. Peter and John had a bonus and an aroma of royalty that emanated from them. It was not an early, an earthly bonus or arrogance. And this is what I said yesterday when people say, oh, she just mad. She just coming strong. No, it's not that. It's God and you need to know it's God. And those that keep saying that, oh, she's just angry. You need to go to God and ask God how to recognize his spirit when it comes bold because you don't know it. It was a supernatural bonus straight from the throne of the room. So if anybody tells you, oh, you're just being so mean and this, tell them no. It's God in you. It's the God in you with the bonus that's speaking. It was a bonus born out of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So don't let nobody tell you you're me and this and this and that. No, you just don't know the spirit of God when it comes. Say that. Do not love to listen to a brother or who abides in fellowship with the Lord Jesus. Even a few minutes with such a man is refreshing for like his master, his past drop fatness. When you have spent time with the creator, there is a sweet perfume that di distills from you in all directions. The anointing can be sensed on you and the spirit of God overtakes the room. This is how the lost are one. They have sensed the refreshing dew of the Holy Spirit upon you, which drew their spirit. A fire begins to kindle in their hearts. When you spend time with the Lord, a cloud of presence forms around you. It is an encircling atmosphere of glory that your prayer and worship cultivate. His presence is thick and tangible. It is sweet, but yet it, yet it is charged with light and power. God's presence is saturated with newness and change. It is impossible not to be refreshed in the atmosphere of his glory. It is foolish to think that we will enter heaven without entering into ourselves. When God's spirit dwells within you and the rim of glory is accessible through prayer and worship, you come into the understanding that God's spirit is communion with your spirit. You can carry the atmosphere of heaven around you like a canopy to transform your surroundings because, you're, because heaven is within you. Catherine Kuhlman is a perfect example of us, of a believer whose lifestyle of prayer led to thousands of people being healed, saved, and set free. When she ministered the cloud of glory, and presence that surround her was tangible. When she began to sing, although she was not a talented worshiper, leader, a musician, the atmosphere would become charged with the glory of God. Then people would be healed and crippled arthritis or jump out of wheelchairs. Many people were touched and impacted by the presence surrounding her ministry. This came directly as a result of her life of prayer and ministering to the Lord. When you tarry with God in prayer and worship, you are positioning yourself for encounters. When you worship the Lord, your spirit is the, the living deeper into the rim of the supernatural where you are sensitive to the Lord's voice and the rim of spiritual 
activity. Did you know that there is consistent activity in the realm of the spirit? Angels are always moving and working on your behalf. When you commune with the Holy Spirit, we become more sensitive to his realm and God can reveal sacred things to us. One day I recall that I was praying and tearing with the Lord. And as I soaked in his presence, time began to slip away from me. And as three hours soon became four and cloud of his tangible presence over, overcame me. It was smoky hazel that began to wrap itself around me. I felt as if I were removed completely from the room where I sat in my chair, caught up in the thick mist of God's glory. This overwhelming sense of, of his presence of God stayed with me throughout the day. As I laid in my bed that night, almost wrapped in the trend drills of sleep, suddenly I felt the presence of God enter the room. The tangible presence carried the magnificent electric atmosphere of God's glory. The air was charged with excitement and anticipation. I felt my heart beating rapidly in my chest as my nature, my natural body reacted to the supernatural presence that had filled the small room. For about an hour, I lay there, not noticing the time or expecting my inter reaction. I simply enjoyed the spectacular, spectacular presence that seemed to be ministering to my spirit, soul, and body as I drifted to sleep. Once asleep, I entered immediately into a dream. I walked along with a tour group on a sunny sidewalk. Palm trees lined the sidewalk as we passed a little house. A man from the group turned to me, pointing at the house. You should go there, he said. You're a lot like her. A lot like who? I asked. But the man just continued to walk away if he, did, if he hadn't heard me. So following his advice, I walked into the house finding a lavishly adored with flowers, pictures of Amy Simpson McPherson, a famous preacher and healing evangelist from the 1920s, lined the walls. In the center of the home stood a massive pulpit carved with wood. I began to walk towards the pulpit, feeling drawn to it. And as I did, I could I could hear Sister Amy's voice preaching, echoing off the walls. I then woke from the dream. Upon walk. Waking, I realized I had been shown the museum of Amy Simpson McPherson that contained the very wooden pulpit that she preached from. Although I had never seen it or been there in the natural, God has given us dreams, visions, and encounters to encourage us, to awaken vision within us, to take us to a new level in anointing. I have had encounters that have been taking me to new levels of gifting, revelation, and healing. Encounters always bear fruits. And lifts us into higher levels of manifestations and calling. Amen. I'm going to stop right here. And we're going to go tomorrow to the river of glory. The river of glory. Because we're, we're almost done. This book is done. And I hope you got something from this book. Because this was just not a book. If you were on here. If you were here and you were listening to this teaching. Miracles in the glory. It unlocked the rim of signs, wonders, and through the presence of God. If you, this is just not a regular book. If you've been following this book, then something should have changed. Because this is a change. This, the, the words that's on here, the people that taught here, brought change. It, they brought change. And if you're sensitive in the spirit, it's the same thing that they have been through, it'll happen to you. It'll literally happen to you. If you're sensitive to it. Amen. I thank you, Jesus, for today. I bless you, God. Enlarge our territory. Catapult us, Father, to the next level. Bring us to another dimension, oh God. Help us to be committed to you, oh God. Help us to be fully committed to you. Committed to you, God. To no one else. Not to people. Not to things. But to you. Help us to be committed to you, Father. Like never before. You are a God that deserves everything. Our honor. Our faithfulness. Our, our sacrifices, Lord. God, we sacrifice for you, Lord. You sacrifice for us. Father, now we want to sacrifice for you. Help us to be be those that would, would, would just be committed and do what you call us to do. And not to be, be saying, oh, no, I can't. God, help us. Help us. Help us. We're chosen. We're chosen. We're chosen, God. Help us, God. Help us to do the will of God. And I'm going to end with this right here, the glory. 
So Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, I will show my holiness to those who are near me and I will reveal my glory before all the people. Leviticus 10 and 3. Listen, it is the voice of someone shouting clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the carves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. Listen, it's the voice of something shouting clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Isaiah 43 and 5. Isaiah 55 and 5. You also will command nations. You will command nations. You do not know. And peoples unknown to you will come running to obey. Because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. Isaiah 55 and 5. Amen. Amen. God is good. God is very good. God is wonderful. He's, he's gracious. He's merciful. Hallelujah. Father, I bless your people this morning. I bless their lives. I bless their family. I bless their, their income. I bless everything that they put their hands to. Father, I pray that the prayers that were prayed today for February will manifest. Father God will manifest, will begin to manifest on this first day of February that you'll begin to move by your spirit like never before. Lord, we thank you. We magnify you. We glorify you this morning. We give you all glory and honor. Father, touch those that are in prisons, those that are in born of court, those, Father, the judges, God. Let them make right decisions today. Father, walk up and down hospitals today, up and down convalescent homes, Father. Those animals that are being abused, oh God, I pray that you send someone to help them. Father, send someone to help those children that are being abused. Father, those convalescent homes, those those that are doing wrong, Father, I be ask you to begin to expose all wrongdoing, Father God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, have mercy, Father, on us. A mercy on those, Father God. Father, mercy, mercy, help those that are grieving today, Father. Touch their lives, touch their homes, touch their families, God. Be with them through the grievings, Father God. Those that are that lost, those that did not wake up this morning, Father, I pray that they found you before they went left here, this earth, God. Father, I thank you, Lord, and I bless you, and I bless your people this morning. Bless them. Stay with them. Protect them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you guys. God bless you. Thank you for being supportive to me. I bless your life, and I bless your home, and I bless your finances. Amen. God bless you.